Okay, right. Um, today I'm going to do a little bit of background on geospatial semantics, just to introduce the theme, moving into linked geospatial data, how this applies to archaeological research, relate this to my own research, then we'll get into some meaty stuff about producing and using linked geospatial data, and a couple of case studies moving through to the interoperating aspect. So, um, Geospatial semantics, what are we talking about? It's basically the fusion of a whole bunch of different sort of strands of research relating to um, the semantic web, um, as Yanovich has, has said here, uh, artificial intelligence. The key bits is the, the GIS, the, the geospatial, uh, and the semantics. Uh, importantly, we've got this concept of linked geospatial data as a specialism of uh, linked data coming out of this as a way of expressing this information. Um, so what is this um, linked geospatial data? Uh, it's basically linked data with, with knobs on, the spatial knobs. Um, it can take various different forms. Um, there's, I talk about simple linked geospatial data. That's simple in terms of the geometries, not because it's easy. Um, but we can, we can do this in a, in a variety of different ways. And it's being driven, so it's quite a major research area with a, um, the big um, standards consortiums behind it. So the W3C and OGC are really pushing this. Um, so I want to talk about simple linked geospatial data. Again, I'm talking about the geometries here, not um, to imply that it's easy. Um, we can talk about gazetteers. We can talk about um, coordinates. Um, and we can leverage sort of fairly traditional, I use the word traditional with linked data. Um, <coughs> interesting thing. Um, but we can use fairly standard linked data approaches <coughs> with this. We don't need to do anything too special. We can, we can visualize things, we can query things, we can link them, show them on maps. The more advanced stuff comes then um, we can, by including richer geometries, so we can actually use points, lines, and polygons, um, spatial relations in here as well. Importantly, we can uh, incorporate coordinate reference <laughs> systems. So we don't, we're not stuck with the sort of web Mercator uh, world's view that Google like to um, use. Um, the way to do this, we implement um, OGC standards, W3C standards, and as I mentioned earlier, the, these two standards bodies have come together to produce uh, the GeoSparkle standard, which is a, a geospatial ontology and query uh, language. So, for archaeological research, how can this really benefit us? Archaeologists never ask easy questions. Um, we'll come back to this, this question in a bit, but it's just sort of a typical thing. I'm interested in all of this, um, and the problem is all this data tends to be siloed off in different places, some of which is linked data, some of which isn't, some of which is spatial, some of which has a spatial component, it's not spatial. Um, it's all over the place. So it's not easy to do archaeological research with, with digital resources without massive amounts of time collating and pulling things together. So my project, GSTAR, is um, due for completion next year, so I'd, I'd better get cracking. <laughs> Building on the um, CDUX CRM and the CRM EH extension, which was done by English Heritage a few years ago, and GeoSparkle. So I'm using existing, leveraging existing ontologies here. And what I'm actually doing, I'm looking at the production of, of linked geospatial data uh, and working with it in the context of archaeological research. Um, so my use case is, is research in its broadest context here, it's not purely academic. Um, in the UK, archaeological research is undertaken regularly for things like environmental impact assessment, planning process, as well as in a sort of purely academic um, context. So how can linked geospatial data um, support these various research processes? Um, and I'm using a range of data, um, tying it to existing um, systems um, from um, <coughs> museums, um, the historic environment records, which are our inventories of where sites and monuments live, uh, English heritage uh, and com commercial contracting units, and the archaeology data service. Um, a lot of the information, as I mentioned, is, is sort of siloed off. So we excavate, the data will end up in, in various different places, um, depending on what type of data it is. And often the links between these, these data sets are, are lost uh, in transit. So the only thing that really ties some of these collections together is, is the spatial component. So what I'm looking at is how can we sort of integrate this using um, the, the geospatial elements. So producing the stuff, um, at a simple level, we can add place identifiers. So we can talk about place names, coordinates, that kind of thing. 
In CDOC CRM terms, we have these, these are all place appellations and they're used to identify a place. Um, at a more advanced level, we can then start to add depictions of these places. So we can say that this particular site is depicted by a polygon. In geosparkle language, we say a feature has some geometry and we express that geometry in a, uh, one of a number of ways. Uh, and what I've been working on is building some pipelines to get data out of systems into an environment where I can um, start making it interoperable. So there's a growing number of, of tools and platforms out there for storage, processing, visualization. Um, it's not a matter of, of starting from scratch here. There's lots of libraries, um, projects, code bases. There's, uh, people are churning out all kinds of useful things. Um, <coughs> spatially enabled triple stores. I'm now using Parliament. Oracle is no more. Um, and we can use web services to get different systems to, to talk to each other. Um, asking it queries, well, we can query using Sparkle on Sparkle Endpoint. And the, the only specialism of that for Geospatial is uh, we use Geosparkle, um, same syntax, um, a few different um, bells and whistles. Um, for those who have an aversion to Sparkle Endpoints, we can wrap these things up in... Um, wrappers, APIs, whatever, embed it in a website to make it a bit more user-friendly. Crucially, we need maps. <coughs> so how do we, you, how do we, what do we do with the results here? Um, again, very flexible, many options. I've described this as a kind of toolbox. We have our linked data stack tools, um, our FOSS WebGIS stack, more tools, uh, and we can use some or all of these things to produce applications that users need. So we can do website -y stuff and in importantly we can leverage web maps. And there's, there's ways of transferring between linked data and the sort of um, web GIS-y uh, standards. So what I've actually done is um, I now have a working GeoSparkle endpoint with all my source data processed. So I have interoper interoperating geosemantic resources. Uh, the next step is to build uh, the demonstrator, which will form the sort of core bit of my, my thesis, which will show um, how this can be used for archaeological research purposes. Crucially, it will have a map-based interface, um, not just for visualizations, but I want to use that as actually a means of, of users inputting polygons into the system. So when people talk about this area, they can draw it and use that as part of the, the GeoSparkle query. A couple of... How am I doing for time? Awesome. So, um, a couple of case studies then. <coughs> um, this is an example of a, a project specific um, resource that was created. The original project was undertaken by Wessex Archaeology with funding from English Heritage, so thanks to them, and it's now being deposited at the ADS. Um, and it has one of the outputs was a linked data component, um, which I built for them at, using um, CDUC CRM and the Stellar Toolkit from the University of South Wales. Cheers. Kerry? Um, although this wasn't a linked geospatial data resource, I couldn't resist, so we, I did put some, some geo in there. There were place, um, place identifiers in the resource. We had, in the UK, we have um, small land divisions called parishes, slightly bigger ones called counties. Um, and using the Open Refine system and the Ordnance Surveys API, it was possible to um, integrate the Ordnance Surveys linked data within this resource. So, what we end up with is there's the graph. Um, it's not particularly clear on the projector, but this whole section down here is all the geospatial bits, and these rather long numbers are the uh, toyed references which allow it to link off to the um, Ordnance Survey. Um, of course, we could extend this further and add some GeoSparkle nodes in addition to this. One of the big strengths of um, linked data in particular is you don't have to do everything all at once. You can always revisit this project at some point and add in a bunch more nodes to describe the um, richer geometries. For example, the parish boundaries. Very tricky when you link to a, a resource, the Ordnance Survey's parish database. That is tied to... Um, geopolitical structures, so parishes are constantly being revised. So if something was indexed with a term parish from a few years ago, 
that may not necessarily be the same parish that you may be using to query the data today if you use the, the linked data approach. So versioning um, is an issue with, with linked data, particularly with historical spatial um, entities. Um, the, a, a, a big chunk of the work that I've been doing has been looking at how do we produce this uh, linked geospatial data from these existing resources. Um, and what I needed to do was tie the ontology that I was using, CRMEH, with, with Geosparkle. Um, and I followed the sort of the, the recommended route um, by the, the Geosparkle developers, uh, which is to uh, align these two ontologies. And I used the RDF um, subclass and subproperty um, methods to inherit both from both parent ontologies. So um, the classes in CRMEH now inherit from Geosparkle and from the, the parent C.CRM. There is also CRM Geo, for those familiar with the um, C.CRM, um, which is a all singing, all dancing, very, very powerful um, spatial extension to the C.CRM. At the time of my research, it, it wasn't really ready for use. Um, it can do an awful lot more, um, but um, I needed a, a simple working solution now. Importantly, the, this alignment process that I went through can also be applied to um, the parent CRM classes, so it could be used on other CRM compliant um, resources, or indeed any other ontology, because it is based on, on the Geosparkle uh, recommended route for alignment. Just to show that visually, so this middle slice here is the CRMEH concept, and we have the concept of a stratigraphic <coughs> unit, a context, is depicted by a context depiction. So that's fundamentally a ditch is represented by a polygon that, that describes the ditch. Um, these inherit the, from the classes down the bottom, which is all these CRM parent classes. So place is identified by uh, place appellation. And above we have the, the geo feature has geometry. And then any particular instance of a context depiction, in this case it's a polygon, and I've chosen to represent it using well known text. So it's actually quite simple, yet very powerful. This has now been applied to all of my source data using a combination of tools, including QGIS and the Stellar Toolkit. Um, so we've got modes, the museum's collection system, going through an XML interchange, RDF and well-known text. The historic environment records provided um, Esri and uh, Microsoft proprietary databases from their HPSMR system, again, to produce RDF and well-known text. And the commercial archaeology unit provided me with a big bucket full of stuff, um, which again I converted to RDF and well-known text. Um, thinking about this process while I was doing it though, it actually struck me that I'm doing it for my research to ask archaeological research questions in the context of my PhD, but it potentially has some wider applicability. Um, all the tools that I'm using are all free and open source. They're all very scriptable, batchable. You could actually use this as a means of publishing linked geospatial data from any of those systems I've just mentioned. Just a thought. So, interoperable. We have project <coughs> resources like the colonization of Britain, which is interoperable. It's up on the ADS. Um, we could use it to do distribution plans. We could do location plans. It's licensed, it's accessible, it's out there. So there's no technological or political barriers to interoperating with this, um, but I don't think to date anyone has. Mm. Uh, interoperating, <coughs> the next level actually making this stuff fit together. Well, hopefully um, the, the outputs from my, my PhD will be showing that this is, this is doable. As I said, I've completed my data layer, working on the application layers, uh, which will um, demonstrate the potential of, of this for, um, for research purposes. At the moment, I have lots of bits working, so apologies for not providing uh, more, more shiny slides, but you've seen some of the mapping elements and the, the web elements in some of the other presentations. It'll be that kind of thing. Um, but crucially, with uh, the ability to actually draw the users to generate spatial information as well as part of the querying um, process. <coughs> Back to that research question then. Um, here is our, our big complex question. 
And just to show how this is interoperating, as part of asking this question, we've got integration of various resources, the museums, from the historic environment records, from commercial contractors. Uh, we're using a range of operations on this data, including the, the spatial or, and basic numeric operations, um, linked data, linking out to, to other resources, um, and presenting it on a map. So I think, I think the interoperating is, um, is happening. Just as a final slide, this was a, a slide that I did for the TACOS thing, which is sort of a vision of how this, this might work in the context of the United Kingdom um, in terms of using linked data and linked link geospatial data to knit um, these various things together. Uh, thanks to my funders, thanks to everyone that's provided me with data, and um, thank you very much for listening. If anyone wants to contact me, discuss anything, please feel free. Thank you.